Hey, it's Michael. I've got good news. Uh, it's snowing like a foot outside, so I'm stuck in the hospital, trapped because I'm on call with surgery, uh, which means I need to be close by, and I have decided to not go home, instead to stay and make videos. So I was looking through my list of videos and which videos it was that uh, I wanted to make, and one of them was on the topic of why are nurses, why are healthcare professionals, um, why does there seem to be such a high prevalence of obesity and people that just don't take care of themselves in the area of healthcare with that being their profession. And you would think that, that we'll just use nurses, nurses for example. Uh, I worked in intensive care for many, many years as a nurse. Uh, traveling around the country, going to different hospitals. I've worked in over 30 different hospitals in intensive care units of different specialties. And mostly I work night shift. Uh, and it's just a very high ratio of, of unhealthy, morbidly obese in, in some cases, uh, healthcare workers, respiratory therapists, uh, even some doctors, nurses, uh, radiology techs, you go down the list and there's, there's just a, a high prevalence of this. And it's always kind of intrigued me, the fact that, hey, these are people that have spent a, a, a vast majority of their intellectual uh, career or a career, you know, their intellectual path learning about the body, learning about anatomy and physiology, pathophysiology, uh, all of the systems of the body and, and what it means to, to actually uh, cause harm to these things by dissonance and not taking care of, care of uh, your body. And still, you, you, know, you see these people that are not in very good health physically. Uh, so the question is, why is this? And I believe that one of the primary reasons for this is because if you take a snapshot of nursing and what nurses do, especially the higher, the ones that take care of a higher critical patients, uh, such as in the emergency room or in intensive care, and I really can't speak too much to, to the ER, but I can speak to intensive care. So what you've got is a scenario, especially at night, uh, where there's always a high stress level. Even when things are moderately stable, there's still the potential for things to become unstable very quickly. Uh, so what you have is you have stress. And also, in the middle of the night, you have tired. So, usually you don't find that a nurse is exceptionally tired during times of stress because the, the uh, adrenaline keeps them up. But when things are kind of settled down, then you have a nurse that could potentially be tired, especially if they're working 13 hour shifts and they're having to take care of other things during the day and they work overtime very often. Uh, so you have stress and then also if you have times of downtime you may have boredom. You know, and this is uh, seldom the case in intensive care but every now and then you do have times of, of boredom. And then uh, you may be upset with administration, you may be upset with something at home, you may be upset with your patient, you may be upset with yourself, whatever. So then you have angry. And then uh, even though you're working with other people, you're still kind of isolated. You know, as an intensive care nurse, it's you taking care of two patients. So you're really focused on these two patients, which is a great thing about being an intensive care nurse, is that you can give really, really good care to your one or two patients, rather than like being on a surgical floor where you may have 11 patients and your, and your care is, is diluted and, and you really can't give 
all of the time that you would really like to each individual patient because of charting and medications and just it's just logistically impossible uh, usually to give that high high level of attention to patients when you have a, a very high nurse patient ratio but in, in intensive care it's, it's a, a requisite you must do that uh, so that's why the nurse patient ratio is lower because the needs of the patient are more so that's one, uh, one drive for someone to become an intensive care nurse is because they want to be able to give that, that very focused care to the patient. Uh, you know, but it's also the fact that your patients may have a tube in their mouth, uh, tube in their airway breathing for them. Uh, they, may be, they may be sedated they, you know, at nighttime, hopefully, if you're, you know, if you're fortunate, your patient's healthy enough that they can just sleep throughout the night. You know, so there are actually times of loneliness. And there's also times of sadness, you know, because patients don't always get better. So there's a lot of, you know, between the stress and the, the sadness of the job, it's impossible to not, take, to not take home the emotional component that encapsulates you while you're at work. It's, it's impossible to not take that home. So, you know, so you have, you know, you do have times of, of sadness. And I can remember distinctly throughout the years uh, individual cases that, that I remember very, very vividly uh, of times where I just had a profound sadness and an empathy and a compassion and just a, a kindredship with somebody that was exceptionally ill or, you know, or their family member was or, or both, you know. So, so, you know, all of these, all of this blast, these are the... These are the reasons that people go to to make decisions that are trying to reduce the stress load from, from blast. So some of the things that people do to reduce their blast response is eating, and then you've got television or internet and maybe off the clock they're doing other things which is more like more television more eating and and basically they're they're potentially not moving and they're not necessarily decompressing themselves in an adequate way considering the high level of stress. So if you look at if you look at men with moving, journaling, nourishing their bodies and decompressing, there's such a high level of stress and emotional component to being a nurse in, in some aspects of nursing that it's very, very important that you decompress from that stress component. Uh, it's very important that you nourish yourself as a nurse, that you drink adequate amounts of water. And I can tell you that as a, uh, as a, a, a night shift nurse or a shift worker, as they'd like to call it, uh, going from day shift to evening shift to night shift and then converting back, uh, it's very hard to maintain a regular sleep schedule. And it's also something where you may be drinking coffee all night long just for the uh, because coffee makes you feel good or because of the caffeine and it's a stimulant or it's just something to do and so you may not necessarily be drinking enough water or eating correctly and then moving uh, typically if you've got two patients they're right here and right here you know they're right next to each other and best case scenario and you're here so that you can visualize both of them. So you're not doing a lot of moving back and forth unless you're just running back and forth in and out of the room, uh, which is a, another scenario altogether. Then in that case, you may be moving your ass off. Um, if you're working on a surgical floor and you have 10 patients, then you're definitely moving because you're going up and down the hall, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it's, uh, that it's focused moving and that you're creating a stronger body because of all of this moving. Basically, you're just running back and forth, uh, but not at a level high enough to where it's uh, where it's there's an aerobic component to it. Uh, 
which isn't necessarily the case. I mean, it's better to, I think that's better than just staying in one place for 13 hours, five days a week. But uh, it's still not what you're, really what you should be uh, focusing on if you're, if you're trying to exercise and if you want to like focus on moving your body and building a stronger body. So you really can't consider work as being that part of your day. You need to set aside a second part of the day to, to just strictly focus on, on exercise and moving. And then educating yourself for journaling. Uh, I don't know too many nurses that journal, but if they did, then it would help decompress this stress and sadness to, to a degree. Now, when something very sad happens or very traumatic happens, uh, say, for instance, it's a patient that we had for a long time in the intensive care unit, and everybody had an opportunity over a period of months to take care of this patient, and we got to know the family well, and then they pass, then, you know, there's sometimes there's situations where, where the, uh, they might bring in a, a, a social worker or somebody for us to talk to to decompress, or we may have a, a meeting of everybody together so everybody can kind of express their, their feelings and emotions on that, but that's not the, the, the typical case. So you can see basically that in this bored, lonely, angry, sad, stressed, tired, that this is one reason that you see a lot of, of nurses that are, that are unhealthy because they don't necessarily have the preparedness or awareness of how these things are affecting their own health. When you look at eating, you know, you've got coffee, pizza, chips, cookies, soft drinks, Just those five things are almost 100% available at a nurse's station. Uh, I could go almost any time of the day, day or night, and I could find this. You can add ice cream, you know, I'm, I'm sure there's a lot of stuff that I'm missing here. But what I'm trying to say is that this stuff is as ready, readily available as if you were driving in your car and you were looking for a McDonald's, Wendy's, Taco Bell, Arby's, whatever. Uh, but the thing is, is as a nurse, you're here in this small environment where you've got these two patients and you're bored and you're sad and you're lonely and you're angry and you're stressed and you're tired. A combination of all of those things, one or two of them together, and it's the middle of the night and it's two o'clock in the morning and you don't get off until 7.30 or eight o'clock depending on how long it takes you to get report. And you start thinking about these things and you see them sitting right there on the desk. So you start thinking to yourself, man, I'm just gonna have a, another cup of coffee. So then you put a few of, you know, a few of your creams in there, you know, maybe four of them, you know, so that's 100 calories right there. And then there's some cookies, you know, so you tell yourself for a while you're not gonna eat the cookies, but then, you know, at, now it's four o'clock in the morning, it's two hours later, and you're having another cup of coffee. And then you're like, I'm just gonna have a cookie. And then after you have one, you're like, well, I've already had one. I'm just gonna have, I'm gonna go ahead and just eat four to hell with it, and I'll just exercise more later. Maybe I'll just have just a little bit of ice cream with those cookies, you know? So you could see, if you do this for five or 10 or 15 or 20 years, and you work as a nurse, hopefully throughout your career, you have a long career, then the cumulative effect of these decisions because of BLAST, they're gonna catch up to you and it will show physically and emotionally, uh, it will present itself. You know? So this concept right here, I believe is one of the main reasons that I feel that we see so many people and, and now we can just stop talking about nurses because this is not just nurses. This is everybody in society. This is people that work in banks. This is people that work, uh, you know, that work at Walmart. I mean, this is just, everybody has a similar process, but for nursing, the, 
blast is is a lot more prevalent and uh, is is a lot higher stress level in nursing than it is in some other uh, forms of you know, some other occupations. So, the question is, if this is you, if you can relate to this, even if you may not be a nurse, how do, excuse me, how do you get out of this pattern? What I would recommend is watching my video on the wave. And what the wave is, is it's, it's either a thought pattern that creates an emotion, a negative emotional trigger, or it's an experience or event that causes a negative emotional trigger. Now, in nursing, there's a lot of these are experiences or events that cause these triggers, but in most of life, it's just thoughts that cause the emotional trigger that causes the blast behavior. So, this is time and this is present moment, and something happens here. We'll call this a wave, and then this is back to present moment. So right about here, is blast. So we can say that this is an event or a thought that creates an emotion. This emotion, in this instance, we're going to call it a negative emotion. Sometimes they're positive emotions, and what happens usually with the positive emotions is that it goes just like that. You don't even realize that you had it. Um, so we can go back to the nurse. So let's just say that something happens with your patient that becomes very stressful. All of a sudden, this event causes you to be stressed out and then shoots up to here. You have this wave, you're focused on your patient, you take care of your patient, and you stabilize your patient. Okay, so now the situation, whatever the event was, is now stabilized. But what happened is during this time you created a wave of emotion within you which is a normal process. The challenge is having an awareness of this process. So we'll call this awareness what happens is most people right here before the level of awareness, they implement this self-soothing uh, way to try and decompress this wave. And this is where the pizza, cookies, fast food, and sitting, and all of these negative behaviors comes in is right here. So, if you would look at my wave diagram, and I explain this in, in, in depth, what you basically want is you want, to, you want to figure out a way to circumvent this with being an observer of your emotional state and having an awareness that this emotional state has just occurred within you. And then here, having a preparedness to get you back here in a healthy in a healthy fashion. Now, being prepared is something that it takes a lot of forethought. Once this once this wave occurs and you implement the blast, 
it's very hard for you to become prepared after you've already got the pizza in your mouth. So what you need to do is you actually need to figure out how to be prepared way over here before this even occurs. You need to have in place a protocol of preparedness. Now for me, what I've got, and, and, and this situation it can, be, can be used in all areas of life. It can be used in all different types of addiction uh, type of experiences, whether, it's, whether or not it's excessive internet, whether or not it's food, alcohol, too much TV, not moving enough, whatever, you know, uh, whatever the, whatever the, whatever the crutch is, whatever the, whatever the blast crutch is, what you need is you have to be prepared prior to the waves happening. These waves are going to happen for the rest of your life. Ultimately, if you can become an observer and have enough awareness and preparedness, then what happens is instead of these waves always being so big, or instead of them building on top of the, each other, what happens is they eventually get smaller and smaller every time they happen because your observer actually intervenes and creates the awareness which allows you to implement the prepared thing and it just goes like that so that it gets you back to present moment and it actually leaves you in present moment for a longer time. So present moment is where good things happen. It's where gratitude takes place. It's where you're calm, stable, content with how things are going in your life. It's where you're safe. It's where you can become a stronger version of yourself. And it's where life is, is, is simpler. This, even though it looks complex here, this is still not so complex that you can't manage it, but this is more better. Uh, so the question is, well, how do you become prepared? One way is that you can journal. And you journal every day, and when you're journaling, what you're doing is you're evaluating the good things that happened throughout the day, you're evaluating the challenging things that occurred, and you're asking yourself, if this challenging thing occurs again, or if I failed today doing something, how can I prepare tomorrow to put myself in a position to succeed instead of to fail? Whether or not it's with junk food, or you didn't actually exercise after you told yourself you were going to, how do you become prepared for these things? So for me, in the scenario of working in the hospital, what I do is I always have a bag of food with me. And I have another video that shows basically everything that is in my pantry. And almost everything that's in my pantry is either in my locker at work or in a drawer very close to me where I am at at work. It's in my car. It's in my backpack. Uh, if I'm playing poker, it's at the poker game. I have and and I have it in my pool case. If I go play pool, I've got healthy snacks everywhere I go, and I also have water. I have water. I don't leave the house without water. I'm never in my car without water. I have a case of car in my water at all times. I have water in my garage. I have water just cases of water in my house, just in case if I, I need it for an emergency. I have water at work. There's no place that I work or that I'm located that I don't have water. If I walk into the pool hall, the first thing I do is I walk up to the bar and I get two bottles of water. If I go into the poker game, the first thing I do is go to the refrigerator and I grab two bottles of water. I always have water. So I also have stuff like almond butter. I have almond bars. And these are all natural, really good snacks. I might have protein bars. I might have green tea. I might have little bags of protein in case if I want to make a shake. I may have like green tea, dark chocolate treats. Uh, you know, so I give myself a variety of stuff 
just to uh, put myself in a position for success in case if I have a blast scenario that I'm prepared and that I can get to a healthier place rather than rather than exacerbate the negative stress and then putting negative behavior on top of negative stress. So uh, I hope that explains a little bit about what it is that I do as far as, as my actions towards trying to, uh, to be prepared. And also, hopefully, it, uh, in some way, you can relate this to the decisions that you make and the patterns that you've made in your life. And, and to understand that, that when these negative emotions occur, that it's very important that you don't act before you have an awareness. So this is acting. And what this action is telling you is that, hey, something's going on right now in your body, in your life, in your mind, in your emotional state. And this, this thing that's telling you that you need to act immediately to fix this blast scenario is lying to you. It is not accurate uh, in most cases. You know, it's, it's, it's very seldom that you must run to 7-Eleven to go get a 48-ounce Mountain Dew and a king-size M&M's uh, in order to save your life, you know. But if you want to save your life, it is imperative that you become an observer and have an awareness of when this negative emotion happens and this blast response occurs. This will save your life. This will save your life. This will not. So that's all I'm going to say about that for now, and I hope this uh, video makes sense. Thanks, and mend yourself.